All right, folks, if we could uh, come back in and everyone uh, grab their seats, uh, we'll begin our next session. All right. We are excited today to have Congressman Jeff Duncan join us to talk about uh, his Expand Act and, uh, and the broader topic of, of energy uh, across the country. Um, I know that uh, Senator DeMint is particularly excited to have the uh, South Carolinian on stage, um, and he'll be in here uh, momentarily towards the end of our discussion. Um, you know, I think you all know that Jeff Duncan has been a consistent conservative voice since coming to Washington in 2010, in that really, really important year of 2010. Um, that class was really huge because it was a Tea Party surge sent here uh, to Washington to reform Washington. Um, and we'll hear uh, later this afternoon from uh, six uh, members of the class of 2014, which I think has a lot of similarities uh, to your class of 2010. Um, and we'll talk about some of the lessons they may have learned uh, from, from, uh, from this last election. But since coming here in 2010, he's led on many of the tough policy fights that conservatives have been pushing. He is consistently at the top of the Heritage Action Scorecard. Uh, he's latched on to the energy issue now and has put together what we think is one of the best, most comprehensive energy reform bills out there in the Expand Act. When we talk about opportunity for all and favoritism to none, we need to understand that in the energy field, reform doesn't mean picking winners and losers based on the size of an organization's lobbying budget. At the end of the day, the mark of real reform is whether or not it creates an even playing field for energy development by removing special interest tax subsidies, by breaking down onerous federal regulations, by opening up access to energy exploration across the country, and by streamlining permitting and licensing processes. Jeff Duncan's bill does all of this and more, and we are excited to have him here. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Well, thank you, and uh, thanks for having me today. I literally just got off an airplane and uh, ran through the, uh, the terminal to get in the car to come here, but it's uh, always great to be among fellow conservatives. And, um, you know, I think about energy, I think about opportunity, and I think about, you know, the GOP, the grand old party, really, really needs, to, needs to reinvent itself or uh, rename itself, I think, the grand opportunity party especially when it comes to energy, and I'm here today to discuss why I'm so optimistic for um, energy and the opportunity in this country. Bear with me just a second. I, like I said, I literally just got off an airplane. It takes just a minute to get, get the thought processes going, but while I'm doing that, I wanted to share um, a couple of articles that were on uh, Market Watch this morning, one of which was oil above $100, never again, Saudi Prince uh, Al-Walid said today. Then the second article, uh, and you can read these at your, at your uh, leisure, oil slump could upend $2 trillion in investments, according to Goldman. Two very insightful articles uh, that uh, really are timed with this. Energy is really a new frontier, and it's something that um, we need to focus more on. But if you think about where we are as a, as, as a global economy with regard to energy, uh, we're really seeing levels of energy prices that no one anticipated ever to happen again. Oil below $100 a barrel, uh, oil below $50 a barrel. And gasoline prices in South Carolina, $1.65 a gallon, $1.85 a gallon. Diesel fuel around $1, uh, excuse me, around $3.20 or so a gallon. I wish it would come down a little bit less for diesel fuel. But what does that mean? What does that mean as we focus on the things that I've been talking about really for four years, and that's expanded energy here in this country? Well, what can we do to uh, unleash and unbridle that innovative and entrepreneurial spirit within America with regard to the energy sector? If you think about energy, it really touches on um, every state, every congressional district, and every American. I mentioned a second ago the, the price of a gallon of gasoline now. I said in November, I was speaking to a group in South Carolina, I said that for every 50 cent reduction in the price of a gallon of gasoline means about a $10 savings for moms and dad per 20 gallon fill up. We're well below a 50% reduction, 50 cent reduction now, we're well below a dollar. So that's a $20 savings and some are realizing 20, 25, $26 savings per fill up. Think about what that translates for moms and dads in this country. How many times do you fill up in a week? Two, three, four times? 
$100 a week savings for moms and dads, that's real money that could be spent in the economy. That's real money that could be spent entertaining. That's real money that could be spent purchasing the uh, goods and services the economy has, but that's real money that could be put in the bank for savings, to replenish a lot of the lost savings after 2008. When I think about the fact that energy touches every congressional district, every state, and every American, I think about the uranium that's mined in Wyoming being used in a nuclear power plant in Oconee County, South Carolina. Or I think about the electricity that that power plant provides to, say, a Michelin Tire Company in Anderson, South Carolina, that produces these mega large construction tires that go on the, the big dump trucks that are being used in the oil sands of Canada. It touches everybody. A thriving energy sector means more money for businesses and individuals to spend, uh, and we talk about the trickle down. When you think about energy and you think about the energy jobs, and, and I talk a lot about, Tim, I talk about Jobs Energy and the Founding Fathers, and that's an acronym that spells Jeff, and I really like that acronym, but um, <laughs> Jobs Energy and the Founding Fathers. What I mean by that? Well, jobs, we can talk all day about energy jobs, and let me touch base on that in just a second. Jobs. You look at North Dakota, look at Louisiana, look at Texas, look at Oklahoma, you look at the states that are producing energy and have those energy jobs, they have very, very low unemployment. In fact, the article I mentioned from Market Watch, I believe, talked about finder's fees in North Dakota for people that are doing menial jobs at, at Burger King or McDonald's or whatnot. I think about the energy jobs, and, and I ask you to think about this with me. The original thought, when you think about energy production, the original thought that you have, the picture that comes to mind is that guy in the hard hat with the, the oily uniform. He's out on the, the drilling derrick, and whether it's out in the ocean or whether it's on shore, and he's got his oily uniform, and he's turning that big chain that's, that's actually helping seat the drill and turn the drill on the derrick as they drill for that. Those are the jobs you're thinking about. But when we talk about energy jobs, it's much more than that, and those are good-paying, long-term jobs. Those guys go out to the, the rigs for 10, 12 days at a time, come back. But the jobs I'm really talking about is everything that supports that because those guys have to get carried out there to the drilling platforms. They've got to take food and drilling mud and diesel fuel to the drilling platforms. That means supply vessels and supply vessel work. Everything that they take out there, the drilling mud's got to be mined somewhere, the, the, the uh, casing, the pipes, and everything that makes the, the drilling platform work has to be carried out there. And all the widgets, all the components that have to be manufactured to make it all work out there, they're manufactured onshore. And the people that are manufacturing and, and pipe fitting and welding, occasionally they'll drop a pipe on an on a auto body, and that auto body's got to go down to the mechanic and have that body fixed, or they may blow an engine or have to have it serviced. And the guys that go out and do the HVAC work or carry the food or work on the food service equipment because they're living quarters and heating and air out on those rigs as well. Those people are on shore. And guess what? They're going to the local restaurants, and they're tipping the waitresses. They're joining the United Way. They're sponsoring ball teams. They're going to church, and they're tithing. The first domino is to really allow more energy production in this country, whether it's oil and gas or whether it's expanded nuclear power. You're putting Americans to work. Those are the jobs I'm talking about, and those are good jobs. And I'll be honest with you, my state of South Carolina would love to see some of those jobs happen if we open up the Outer Continental Shelf area there in, uh, off the coast of South Carolina, whether it's South Atlantic or Mid-Atlantic. Open up that Atlantic OCS for more en energy production. It's one of the things the Expand Act does, and we'll get into the details on that in just a second. But those are the jobs. And if you fly down to Louisiana as a state, I've really come to love, and you fly to Lafayette, and you drive down Highway 90, or I think it's 181 that parallels 90, and you go from Lafayette, and New Iberia, and Oma, and Thibodeau, and go on down to Port Fouchon, and you'll see the port activity, but on your way, you're going to be on a four-lane road, you're going to see business after business after business that's supporting some facet in the oil and gas business. That's why they have low unemployment. I want to see that in South Carolina, I want to see that across this country as we expand uh, energy production in this nation. How do we do that? Well, we open up the Outer Continental Shelf area. That's one thing the Expand Act does. Opens up more of the OCS. If you think about it, George Bush actually opened up uh, almost all of the OCS that are currently under a moratorium, and, and President Obama reinstated that. And so now drilling activity that you have 
uh, offshore in America is off the coast of Alaska, and it's in the generally the western Gulf of Mexico. You see very little uh, other drilling activity happening on the OCS. You've got some uh, old wells off the coast of California. California is blessed with energy resources as well. And so I think we ought to open up more of the, the Outer Continental Shelf. We ought to do that first by allowing more seismic activity to happen. That's one thing we tried to push for, uh, at least in the mid-South Atlantic, is more seismic activity so we can see what recoverable resources might be out there. Because it's been about 30 or 35 years since we did any seismic in the Atlantic Ocean to see what, whether there were any recoverable resources there. And so we're looking at 30, 35-year-old seismic graphs that were shot with 30-year-old technology. Let's get into the 21st century. Let's think about 3D and 4D seismic technology that can actually not only look down into the earth, but can then take that, that seismic and spin it around and really look for those salt domes and look for where there might be recoverable resources and limit, eliminate a lot of steps of exploration and go into more energy production. We need to allow that 21st century technology to happen uh, off the coast of South Carolina, off the coast of North Carolina, off the coast of Virginia, off the coast of Georgia, states that currently want to see that activity happen. And if you think about really the environmentalist pushback on any seismic work is that you're going to hurt a marine mammal when we really can't point to a single episode anywhere in the world where a marine, marine mammal has been killed or injured through seismic work. I asked Sally Jewell, the Secretary of the Interior, in front of the committee to, to give me those examples as we were talking about seismic work uh, in an environmental impact study. Give me an example, because we're doing seismic work in the Atlantic, but it's up in Nova Scotia. It's in Canadian waters. Those are the same waters that the right well that transit the waters off my state transit in Nova Scotia. They can't point to that. But we've allowed mitigation efforts to happen to say, look, if there are any mammals in the area, we're going to mitigate that. We're going to stop activity. If we know the, the migrating patterns of certain mammals, we're going to not allow seismic work. Okay, that makes sense. But if you think about the seismic that's going on off the coast of Africa, Brazil, and the Mediterranean, off the coast of Indonesia, off the coast of Canada, and Nova Scotia, you see a lot of seismic work. The same dynamics are there. They don't have the mitigation efforts that we are required to have in this country. And so when I think about what I talked about earlier, the price of a barrel of oil is now below $50. I, I talked to a buddy of mine, former Congressman Jeff Landry in Louisiana. I said, help me understand the dynamics that might be at play now if we're looking at $50 a barrel oil or less, what does that mean to the Gulf Coast states? What does that mean to the oil and gas producers in the Gulf of Mexico? And what does that mean in the Bakken? You know, there's got to be a break-even point to where you, know, you sell a barrel of oil and recover your expenses, make a profit. If you drop below that for a longer period of time, it's not going to be profitable. What does that mean? And he said, Duncan, he said, one factor that's never talked about in the price of a barrel of oil is the regulatory cost. See, it costs more to produce a barrel of oil in this country than it does almost anywhere else in the world because of the regulatory environment that we have to operate in. And so we really need to address, and the Expand Act does some of that, address some of the regulatory environment that businesses operate in in doing oil and gas production. It also addresses the regulatory environment that nuclear power plants operate under. Not the ones that are currently operating, but going forward, how do we build a new nuclear power plant in this country? See, in my state, we have one of the few nuclear power permits, a new power plant being constructed, a new reactor being constructed in Jenkinsville, South Carolina. There's only two that have been permitted since I've been in Congress that I'm aware of. One of them's right across the river in Augusta, Georgia with Southern Power. The other one's with uh, SCE and G and SCANA over in Jenkinsville, South Carolina, right across a county line from my district. And it took decades to get that permitting. It shouldn't cost tens of billions of dollars of investment in compliance with the regulatory environment to build a new nuclear power plant. If you think about nuclear power, and, and, and I'll touch base on this just a minute and we'll skip, we'll, we'll move on, but nuclear power, we ought to look at mod modularization and miniaturization of nuclear power. If you think about nuclear power, at any given time we've got almost a hundred nuclear power plants, small nuclear power plants, floating around the seas of the world in the United States Navy. Not a single mishap that I'm aware of. And I'll bet they didn't have to go through all the regulations that the Jenkinsville plant had to go through. We ought to be able to come up with one, two, three proven designs for a nuclear power plant and replicate that. Because nuclear power is 
It's clean. There's no carbon emissions other than the backup generators and maybe the, the cars pulling into the parking lot. Nuclear power works. We're proud to have a nuclear power plant in my district. I think that is, is one thing that we need to look at as well, and that definitely ties in well with what we talked about from the regulatory environment. America's, Americans are in need of an all-of-the-above energy approach. And when you think about all of the above, you think about wind, solar, hydrogen, you think about all those groovy technologies that I really like. I like the, the look of a windmill. I think that's neat that you can harness the wind. And some say, well, it's free. Well, it's not free because it's a significant investment in the wind turbines and in the, in the location and the transmission lines and everything that goes about there. It's not free, but it does take an investment. I like that technology. But it's intermittent. The wind doesn't blow all the time. Sun doesn't shine all the time. I like the solar technology as well. To harness energy from the sun is really, I think, groovy technology as well. It still requires transmission lines. It still requires placement areas. It still requires, hey, if you look at a map of the western United States where a lot of those sunny days are, a lot of the open spaces are, who owns it? It's owned by the federal government. And so if we want to expand the availability of land for solar and wind, we need to open up more of that federal land for that type of production as well. See, when we talk about opening up federal land for energy production, the first thing a lot of folks think about is you want to put oil and gas derricks out there. You want to start oil and gas production. Yeah, I do, but I also want to open up that land for solar and wind as well. And it also requires opening up that federal land for transmission lines, opening up that land for roads and bridges and, and the cell towers and a lot of other things that are necessary in order to make those technologies work as well. And so part of the Expand Act would open up that federal land to more energy development. And there's a sidebar that we never talk about and the Expand Act doesn't at this point, but we ought to talk about mining. Mining for uranium, but mining for the rare earths that make it all work. See, without rare earth minerals, a lot of this technology doesn't work either. And we're relying on China for a lot of the rare earths right now. You've got a cell phone in your pocket, I'm sure, there's a lot of rare earths in that as well. We ought to talk more about rare earth minerals and uh, the fact that that federal land that I'm talking about holds a lot of those rare earths, but they're currently off the table. I'll tell you one country that's going around the world gobbling up the mineral rights of rare earths, and that's China. We need to be cognizant of that. So let's talk about Expand Act a little bit. It's a truly all the above energy approach. Open up that federal land for oil and gas and, and wind and solar production that we talked about earlier. Um, opens up more of the Gulf of Mexico. See, right now, most of the Gulf of Mexico is the western Gulf of Mexico, central and western Gulf. None of the eastern Gulf is open. Now, there are some environmentally sensitive areas. We're not talking about those areas. We can exclude some of the environmentally sensitive areas. There's some areas out there where the United States Navy, and I would assume the Air Force, do some bombing range. They do carrier landings, and they're very sensitive from a national security standpoint. Those are flight lines, and those are areas that they practice. Those can be off limits as well. But why shut down the whole eastern Gulf of Mexico for those very reasons? And just as another sidebar I was thinking about on the plane as I came here is what the president did with Cuba recently. And regardless of how you feel about uh, opening up and normalizing relations with Cuba, the thought occurred to me that if we do open up and normalize relations with Cuba, is that going to open up uh, more access to Cuban waters for American energy producers? Right now, they're open to Chinese and Russian energy producers who probably aren't doing it with the same EPA and OSHA regulations that we're required to follow that drive the cost of a barrel of oil up for American producers that I talked about earlier. But if that does open up more of those Cuban waters, what does that say to the whole eastern Gulf of Mexico closure that we talked about just a second ago? And so you can't have that without having a conversation about the eastern GOM as well. That's shallow and deep water. I was uh, pleased to be a part of implementing one thing I think the Obama administration got right. You don't hear that come out of a conservative's mouth very often. But one thing the Obama administration got right was a transboundary hydrocarbon agreement signed with Mexico by Hillary Clinton at a summit in Cabo. What is the, it's a mouthful, I realize that. The transboundary hydrocarbon agreement. It opened up a million and a half acres in the Gulf of Mexico. If you can think about 
a, a boundary between the United States and Mexico. You think about that border in Texas and New Mexico. Think about a maritime border or a maritime boundary, that border extending out into the Gulf of Mexico where we have territorial waters on the Mexican side and territorial waters on the U.S. side. Well, under that maritime boundary are recoverable resources. And for a long time, that million and a half acres in that, <clears throat> what they call the western gap part of the Gulf of Mexico was off limits. Nobody was producing. Mexico wasn't producing. The U.S. wasn't producing. And so they signed this transboundary hydrocarbon agreement that said, we're going to allow that area to be produced. We're going to allow those shared resources to be produced, and we're going to share revenues, we're going to share technology, we're going to share some of the regulations. Well, once they signed that agreement, we asked uh, Ken Salazar, the Secretary of the Interior at the time, how about sending us the implementing language so we can implement that agreement? We would like to open up a million and a half acres of deep water in the western Gulf uh, to energy production. Because we believe there's recoverable resources there that could go into that national security energy mix of American energy independence. He wouldn't send us the implementing language. So after about a year of that, Doc Hastings and I and a number of others on the committee working to try to get that, I decided to write it myself. So I wrote the transboundary hydrocarbon implementing language. We passed it through the House, bipartisan. It wasn't unanimous, but it was bipartisan. Went to the Senate, couldn't get anybody to deal with it over there. So we were able to get it in the omnibus last year, last December, and guess what? That opened up a million and a half acres in the western Gulf, and they had a lease sale, I believe, in August or September on some of that. So we're going to start developing that. Well, if it can happen there, if we can do it in the western Gulf, why can't we do it off the coast of South Carolina? That was 5,600 feet of water or deeper. Off the coast of my state, we're talking about 100 or 120 feet deep, 70 miles out, shallow water. Shallow water in the field of energy exploration versus ultra deep in the western gap. So think about that. People say we don't want to have another deep water horizon and we don't want to have a, an energy issue off the coast of South Carolina, nor do I. Nobody's advocating for reckless drilling or anything. I, in fact, I think we're safer today than we ever have been with regard to energy drilling and production. But if you, if you think about it, you can't compare apples and apples. Off the coast of uh, Louisiana and out in the Gulf of Mexico, where horizon was, 5,600 feet deep. Off the coast of South Carolina, 120 feet deep. 5,600 feet, you've got to get a robot to go down there and try to cap a gusher with a guy up on the surface with a PlayStation controller looking at a TV screen trying to operate that thing. Off the coast of South Carolina, God forbid if anything happened, somebody jumps in the water with a diving suit on, takes the wrenches and a blowtorch and all the tools they need and take care of it right then. So that's the kind of thinking we need to have. I just finished uh, talking about expand real quick, and, and I'm very passionate about energy. I can talk about energy all day in a lot of different realms, but the Expand Act is something we're going to reintroduce this year. It schedules leasing for the OCS. It allows the seismic work. It allows a 37.5% revenue sharing to come back to the states that are, are new areas. 37.5%. My state would love to have 37.5% of oil produced uh, or revenues produced off our coast. Because guess what? My General Assembly can direct that to the roads and bridges and the infrastructure needs that we have in South Carolina. Now, there's a, a different mix of energy revenue sharing in this country. Wyoming got a billion dollars last year in revenue sharing. Louisiana and Texas, Louis, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida each split $500 million, $100 million each. Wyoming got a billion. Louisiana got $100 million. We may want to look at that, but South Carolina and other states going forward say we're going to try to get the best deal we can, and right now we're talking about 37.5%. So leasing and exploration in, in Alaska, look, we've got ANWR and the, and the National Petroleum Reserve up there, areas that are proven to have resources that uh, we should look at. We should have a leasing program up there off the coast of Alaska, and um, just going through the bill here, it, it breaks down right-of-ways and it breaks down uh, access on federal land that we talked about earlier. Um, it does prohibit the designation of new wilderness areas that may have uh, resources. Let's slow walk the designation of wilderness areas. And this is the guy who enjoyed the Bob Marshall Wilderness numerous times in Montana and still do. And so I, I appreciate the wilderness areas. But if we've got some energy issues there, maybe we take a very comprehensive look at, uh, at those areas before we just designate them wilderness review areas. Um, a lot of things here regarding 
um, the EPA and the ability to stop energy production with filing lawsuits and and uh, a rollback of energy regulations that we talked about earlier. And I keep pointing to the thing that Jeff Landry told me is the cost of barrel oil in the United States costs more to produce than anywhere else because of the regulations. We really ought to take a look at the regulatory environment. It, it, it touches on ca uh, Keystone Pipeline and assuming the Senate does their work and the President doesn't veto it or we override it, maybe Keystone will happen, I'll pull that out. Uh, it won't be necessary anymore. Uh, it talks about reopening Yucca Mountain. Yucca Mountain something that we've invested and continue to invest uh, money in because they're still collecting money out of uh, the ratepayers in South Carolina. They're still collecting money out of those, out of their uh, utility bill every week or every month. Reopen Yucca Mountain. We can have a long conversation about Yucca Mountain and I'd be glad to at any time, but um, it keeps the Endangered Species Act from being able to hamper oil and gas production in this country and other energy uh, resources. Uh, it rolls back some of the energy subsidies and things like uh, we saw with Solyndra and uh, dis disincentivizes those type things the administration has been able to, to use. And, um, and then the last thing that I'll talk about is uh, the whole climate change. It doesn't allow the climate change aspects of uh, low carbon emissions to stop what is proven. And that's oil and gas production in this country and utilization of proven resources that aren't in a minute. I talked about wind and solar a minute ago being intermittent. What did I mean by that? Sun doesn't shine always, the wind doesn't blow. So until we come up with the ability to store that energy, this harvest through wind and solar, it makes it a very uh, volatile energy source. See, in order to, to be able to store enough usable energy to run a manufacturing plant from wind and solar, you have to have humongous batteries. We've got to focus on, I think, on the R&D side on how to miniaturize and, and expand the capacity of a smaller battery system for wind and solar in order to make it viable. If you think about a Tesla, it can only go so far because of the battery. One of the things Elon Musk, one of the issues he has is battery capacity. It's a lightweight vehicle, it's, uh, it's battery powered, but you can only have so many batteries in there. If you had, it, had too many batteries, it'd be too heavy and still wouldn't be able to travel as far. And so there's, there's a balance there. So look into that as well. Look into the battery capacity and look at uh, wind and solar when we think about uh, energy and, and using those technologies as well. So I'd be glad to try to answer any questions. Great. Uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I've maybe great. gone a little over. So. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. That was great. Um, now I'd like to invite uh, Nick Loris up. Um, Nick is our uh, Herbert and Joyce Morgan Fellow at the Institute for Economic Freedom and Opportunity here at Heritage. Uh, and Myron Ebel is the Director for the Center for Energy and Environment at CEI, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Um, thanks, gentlemen, for joining us for our panel. Um, before we open it up for questions, a uh, couple minutes of remarks from both of you, and uh, then we'll ask the audience for questions. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'll start off and then turn it over to Myron. Congressman, thanks for those remarks and thank you all for being here today. Uh, when I was in North Dakota, uh, I saw what the congressman was talking about and I ate at this little uh, restaurant that was basically a trailer park and it was a mom and daughter who moved from California to Williston, North Dakota to start this restaurant chain because they couldn't do so in California. And I never thought that I would actually meet someone who voluntarily left California to come live in North Dakota, but that's what this economic opportunity has provided. And Congressman, you did a great job focusing on the opportunities that the energy sector has provided us and this oil, shale, and gas revolution has provided us over the past few years. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about uh, the other part of what Heritage Action has done in this favoritism to none, because we've seen over the past few years, what works and what doesn't in the energy policy. Uh, and when markets are free and open to competition, we've seen job creation, we've seen billions of dollars in, of private money injected into the economy, uh, and frankly, a better standard of living. And when markets are strangled by regulation uh, that are devoid of any meaningful environmental benefit, when you have subsidies that pick winners and losers in the marketplace, and when you have uh, either efficiency mandates or renewable fuel mandates that uh, force the, the use of one good over another, uh, you're faced with higher costs, you're faced with a worse standard of living, wasted taxpayer dollars, uh, and less choice. And I think what's probably most perverse that I don't think conservatives do a good job of talking about enough 
uh, is that even though these policies, these subsidies, uh, mandates, things like that are intended to promote specific en energy technologies may be well-intentioned, they actually do more harm to the long-term progress uh, than actually help it. And it's this dependence on government that perpetuates stagnation rather than competition. And to give you an example before I turn it over to Myron, let me read you a quote from the New York Times. It reads, Matthew Wald writes, a new generation of windmills that Don Quixote could never tilt at is ready to take its place as an economical and important source of the nation's energy. Because of striking improvements in technology, the commercial use of these windmills, or wind turbines as the builders call them, has shown that in addition to being pollution free, they can now compete with fossil fuels in the cost of producing electricity. Now that reads kind of like a quote that uh, maybe was tossed around during the wind production tax credit debate you know, over the past few months. Matthew Wald wrote that in September of 1992. Almost 23 years later, the arguments are basically the same. You know, just give us a few more years, just give us a few more dollars and, and we'll make it on our own. And when that extension runs out, it's the same thing, asking for another year, asking for a few more billion dollars. And when you have a large part of your production costs paid for by the taxpayer, that's what you're going to get. Your incentive structure changes pretty dramatically. Uh, you're focused more on securing that next handout rather than truly innovating and lowering costs to compete in the marketplace with conventional sources of energy or whatever the technology may be. Uh, so that's why we're not just in, focusing on opportunity for all, uh, because we've seen what opportunity provides us. We're really focusing on favoritism to none because it protects the taxpayer, it provides opportunity for these technologies that may be emerging and it either lets them stand up and compete on their own two feet uh, or die a painful death, but at least it's, it's dead through their own private investment, not through the taxpayer. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Myron and be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, I want to thank Tim Chapman and Nick Loris and Heritage Action for America to, for inviting me to participate in this. I think it's very valuable to give so many of our solid conservative members of Congress a forum to, uh, to talk about policy. And Representative Duncan is a very conservative member. He's very solid. And uh, as someone from the rural west, the federal land state area, uh, I always get kind of worried when someone gets on the Natural Resources Committee, a conservative who isn't from the West, because he doesn't always get all these issues, but he gets them. He's, he's, he's a, a great member of the, the Natural Resources Committee. Uh, you know, we have a competitive advantage in this country. It's, we have huge amounts of energy, coal, oil, natural gas. Uh, we have over 200 years of coal. We now have over 100 years of natural gas, and nobody really knows how much oil we have because, uh, as Congressman Duncan said, our offshore areas have not been explored. There is a prohibition on exploring the offshore areas that are, that are not open to, to oil and gas production. So we're the only country in the world that doesn't know what its oil resources are. Now, the, the fracking revolution, the, the shale oil and gas revolution, is due not to government but to the market. And that's our other big advantage. We have a very innovative, competitive market, and that is what has created that revolution. Our competitive disadvantage is the regulatory state and, and all of these special interest uh, handouts, favoritism towards some. Uh, we have in this country uh, huge problems in getting anything permitted, and that's why w uh, one of the big important things in this bill is what Representative Duncan has done to streamline permitting. And the most important is he turns over oil and gas leasing on federal land to the states. Now, uh, it used to be that you could go out, if you were trying to, if you had a BLM lease, uh, an oil lease, you could go to the BLM office and get a permit in a day to drill a well on your lease. Now it takes months or years. That's why oil and gas production on federal land and offshore is going downhill, whereas on private land and state land, it's going up, up, up. So I would say that's a very important part of this bill. And you know we need to figure out how to maximize our competitive advantage here, which is we have the world's greatest energy resources, and minimize our competitive disadvantage, which is we have the most oppressive 
land use and natural resource regulations in the world. A big project in Canada the, under the uh, Environmental Assessment Act, the Harper government changed the law. The average was five years to get it permitted. The law is changed. They have to get it done now within three years. A big natural resource project in this country takes 10 to 20 years if it ever gets done at all because the environmentalists have figured out that you can kill a project by delaying it to death. And that's what President Obama is trying to do with the Keystone Pipeline. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's open it up to questions from the audience. Right down here. Yes, sir. It's on. All right. Hi, my name is James Reed with George Washington University. Um, in the last six months, we've seen oil drop from $100 a barrel now to 46 And I've read the Market Watch articles was saying it's a falling knife where it can go below 40 30 I've even read an article saying it can go to $14 a barrel. And my question is about given the opportunity to drill, some of the shale companies might not drill because of the unprofitability unprofit of that. So my question is what can Congress do, what can... Um, policy experts do to incentivize these companies to drill in this um, climate of low, low oil prices. Yeah, the question is, that with, the, with the plunging price of, of oil per barrel, does that disincentivize people to drill when it comes to shale? Um, and if so, uh, can we, uh, are the things that we should be doing, should we, we be concerned about that? And, that? and I'm not sure what the price point is for break even for drilling in the Bakken. Um, I, I do know one thing Congress can do is try to lessen the regulation and the regulatory environment to make it easier. Uh, as I talked about earlier, uh, the price of a barrel of oil is, is higher. Cost of production of a price of, of a barrel of oil in this country is higher than anywhere else. Uh, that's one thing we can do. But if you think about the Bakken, I think the gentleman mentioned earlier is that, you know, where this activity is happening is on state and private land. And really the federal government hadn't been involved in it. And uh, that really... Uh, it's attributable to past presidents who basically said we're not going to regulate state and private land, and that uh, that enabled it. And so um, I want to see more of that. Maybe less in the government, the federal government's involvement in it as a whole will help the folks be incentivized. When the federal government gets involved in something, the price usually goes up. Yeah, I would just add that <clears throat> it's important to get the policy right now, and even if that doesn't incentivize necessarily more drilling at this point, when that price point uh, gets to a point where they can act on, on new fields, whether it's offshore or onshore, it's important to open up those areas now so when the price rises, when the new equilibrium comes, they'll be able to act on those new plays. You know, different areas of the region uh, have different cost measures because of the geologic makeup, and it costs more to frack in one area of the country than it does others. Uh, lowering the regulatory costs is certainly an important part of that aspect. Um, but that's why I think we really just need to focus on opening these areas and, and, and letting the market determine when the businesses make these investments and make these decisions. So when they can and when they want to, we aren't in a place to be able to do it because of the laws. Uh, well, you know, in uh, a year ago, people said oil would never get below $100 a barrel, and now we've got some people saying it'll never get $200 a barrel. Uh, who knows? Uh, I think what Nick has said is absolutely right in what Representative Duncan said about getting down the regulatory costs. But I would just point out one example. In 1995, when the Republicans took over Congress, they sent legislation to open the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to oil exploration. President Clinton vetoed that legislation, and the environmental defense, the environmental group defense of that was, well, it won't help with the currently high gasoline prices because it will take 10 years before that oil starts flowing from Anwar. Well, I believe that we should have people in Congress who think more than a couple months ahead. We need to think 10, 20 years ahead, and that's, that's why this bill is an important bill. And I, I would just, the last thing I'll say on this is that we've got to push back against these, this desire to, to raise gasoline taxes right now. Um, because oil prices are so low, they're, they're not always going to be this low. And now's not a good time to raise taxes. Moms and dads and businesses are just now starting to experience a little bit of economic um, incentive. I mean, and they're putting money in their pocket. It's cheaper to deliver the goods and services. It's cheaper to take the family out to eat. And so why, uh, why throw cold water on this economy? It, it, it compensates for the higher medical insurance costs. <laughs> we have a question right here. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Knight, notice with 
satisfaction in the background that was handed out at this conference about the Expand Act that you are calling for the uh, uh, removal of the special tax breaks for all energy sources. But I wanted to add, I didn't see anything about the special limited liability considerations given to nuclear power, uh, if, especially if you're going to be removing or easing the licensing and regulation requirements if you don't at the same time remove those special liable liability limitations, uh, aren't you inviting the same kind of problems that occurred with the uh, bailout of the big banks if there should be another Three Mile Island and there would be a political reaction against this kind of uh, legislation? Can you repeat that really well, quick? Well, I, let me just say this about nuclear power, that they cannot depreciate and capitalize some of the capital expenses for nuclear power. And and that is causing the cost of nuclear reactors to go up. That that isn't talked about in this bill, it's a it's more of a tax policy issue, but um, if you look at the permitting the, the billions of dollars of permitting costs for nuclear power and then you, you factor in the the aspect that some of the capital expenditure can't be depreciated uh, within that industry the way the other capital expenditures and investments can be, um, it's, it's still a disincentive to make those investments. And we're already talking about hundreds of billions of dollars anyway, so. Others? Yes, sir. Does your expand act allow for exports of our energy resources like they get to do up there in Norway and Canada and Saudi Arabia? Or is the prohibition against exports still remain under expand? Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, there's a lot of talk right now about um, exporting our oil or actually allowing U.S. produced oil to be um, put out on the global market. And mm -hmm. I don't have a firm uh, opinion on that yet. The, the, the free marketeer in me says that if you increase supply to meet demand, then price goes down. The, the problem that I, and I talked with Jeff Landry about this a little bit this morning, uh, just because he's one of the guy, my go-to guys, but um, the refineries in this country aren't set up to, to refine a lot of the oil, the type of oil that's produced in the Bakken. Uh, it's more set up to, to produce or to refine sweet oil or sweet crude. And so we import a lot of oil that goes to our refineries and is produced uh, and produces all the products that uh, barrel of oil produces. And so we've also got to address the refineries in this country and whether build new refineries allowing the retooling of some of the refineries, the way I understand it, uh, if we're ever going to allow the oil to be exported. And, and these yeah. gentlemen may know a little bit more about it, it than I it's do. A, but it's a good question because I, I do think that's going to be one of the hot you know, hot spots next year. Um, Nick, maybe if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, we support lifting the ban on crude. Um, and um, it is kind of a, uh, it's an interesting issue even within the conservative movement. It is. Um, because you have conservatives um, who come down on different sides of the aisle for different reasons. But Nick, maybe if you could walk folks through why we're, we're supportive of that and um, how we've been talking to our friends. And, and, about and while he's doing that, um, I have a, there was a vote that was cast last week you may have heard about, but I have some meetings with some of the leadership team this afternoon, so mm. I'm going to have to leave. Um, and I do apologize for that, but uh, that's what's come up. So well, I'm okay, leave. tell them to be bold, okay? <laughs> oh, <that's right. laughs> yeah. Amen to that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you to the Thank congressman. So Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, at Heritage, we're a pro-free trade organization, and energy is no exception. You know, there's, we think that oil, crude oil, uh, natural gas should be treated, you know, just like any other good or service that we trade regularly uh, around the country, so we should lift the ban on crude oil exports. You know, there's been some concern among politicians that it's going to raise the gasoline price, so uh, we should be hesitant on doing so. Uh, I would say that one, that shouldn't be a concern, but even so, because of what the congressman said about matching up refining capabilities, you're actually creating a more efficient oil distribution chain by getting this light oil to where it can be refined more efficiently in European markets where we can take on the heavier crudes from places like Canada and Mexico. So it would actually lower gasoline prices in the uh, intermediate run. So. Um, it's the same with natural gas. With LNG exports, we're, we're pro-LNG exports. We think that uh, really the Department of Energy shouldn't be in the business of determining if natural gas exports should be in the public interest, which they have to do uh, before we can export 
LNG to non-free trade agreement countries. It's a nonsensical barrier right now. And yes, it's going to take a long time for the U.S. to build those LNG export terminals and actually get the, the natural gas to, to places where the, the price is much higher than it is in the United States. But again, it's about the, getting the policy right now so the, the private sector has the, the right incentive to act. Great. Well, uh, if I could add just one thing. I, I think, you know, we've had this long... Uh, kind of level of concern about national energy security, going back to the Arab oil embargo and the Nixon price controls. And everybody uh, has tried to work around the fact that we have all these energy resources that we're not using and that we're not producing, and we have to import more and more oil from the Middle East, and we don't like those people, and it would be nicer not to buy oil from them. Well. Uh, you know, we're at a point now where, where we can produce a, a lot more oil and gas, and I think these national energy security arguments that there's some kind of Band-Aid fix for it uh, rather than simply producing more energy, those have disappeared. You know, the, 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 the rationale for the ethanol mandate, for uh, a cafe standards, for electric cars, all, the, all that rationale is, has gone. Uh, we have huge quantities of coal, oil, and natural gas, and there's no reason that we can't uh, benefit by using it and by exporting it. And so I, I hope that uh, the export bans will be lifted, but the environmental groups are doing everything they can to stop the export of coal uh, by blocking coal export terminals. And unfortunately, they, they control the governorships of the three western states, which is a problem, Pacific states. And they're trying to block LNG terminal permitting, and they're trying to keep the ban on oil exports. And I think that this is a, is a huge obstacle to our e economic prosperity. And I wish these national e uh, energy security people uh, would realize that the problem has been solved. The, the problem that they identified back in the 70s is no more. Time has passed them by, and it wasn't their policies that solved the problem. And so they need to rethink it, and I, I hope they do. Thank you. We have time for one more question. All right. I think, um, well, uh, yeah, actually, why don't we close up, and because uh, we've got a big one coming on. Um, thank you to the panelists. Um, and if uh, folks will take another 10-minute break, we'll have um, Senator DeMint uh, back on stage here in 10 minutes. He'll be introducing Senator Cruz. And then just to give a plug for you for the remaining two panels, um, we're going to have um, six of the really conservative great guys who were elected in 2014 here after that to talk about what 2014 meant, what they think uh, the American people were saying to them in this election. Um, so that will be very interesting. Don't forget, don't please don't miss that. And Jim Jordan will wrap us up um, at the end talking about how conservatives can lead in this next Congress. So see you all in 10 minutes. Thanks.